I am with Police Chief Dan Parkinson here in Cornwall. Chief, with the Liberal Party talking about legalizing marijuana um, and Cornwall having a particular special focus on uh, drug crimes because of the, the bridge crossing and the different law enforcement agencies that work together, do you have any particular um, issues in dealing with marijuana here in Cornwall? You know, the, uh, the position that the Canadian Association of Chiefs took, though, was that uh, in any and all jurisdictions across the country, there should be a, an easier method of dealing with, with offenders who are found with less than 30 grams of marijuana. And uh, our, our strong suggestion to the government was to allow us to issue a ticket with a set fine on it, and uh, the person would not be subject to a criminal record if that process was, was introduced. Uh, it's not decriminalizing marijuana, it's just providing us an opportunity to, uh, to streamline the, the, the processing of an individual. Now, in a previous interview, I think you mentioned that this, this, this Cornwall Police Service um, ha does about 18,000 calls per year? 18 to 20,000 calls per year is pretty average, yeah. What chunk of those roughly would be drug offenses? Um, I'm going to say in, in the... Um, the one to two hundred range. I mean, it's, okay. it's not a large number of incidents that we deal with. And you mentioned the um, the smuggling issue through Cornwall. You know, the fact that product or people actually go through this area and are smuggled into the states or smuggled from the states into Canada is uh, is not an indication that the drug problem is any greater here in Cornwall or anywhere else. The the product is moving through. So we may be a transshipment area, but. Uh, you know, the, the numbers don't basically support the fact that we have more kids in Cornwall who are experimenting with marijuana than, say, any other community. No, but for example, with the illegal cigarettes, we had a large population of sellers and users of, or purchasers of, of the illegal cigarette bags here in Cornwall compared to, say, you know, Brockville. Well, I, su I suppose it's accessibility. Yeah. You know, it's um, but but the market is, mm -hmm. is not just here; it's it's right across the country, and uh, large amounts are coming in, and they're being shipped to centers across across Canada. Now, we've seen many politicians and, and even some law enforcement equate marijuana on parallel with a lot harder drugs like a heroin or cocaine, or and of course uh, the big trade nowadays is with prescription drugs like oxy's before they changed it and some other drugs. How do you personally, as, as chief of police, view the amount of resources and time that gets spent on marijuana and, and arresting people and processing them through the system? My, uh, you know, my, my own personal research into the into the subject. Of course, I'm very interested in ensuring that young people don't end up in the formal justice system. I'd like to put that out there first. Um, marijuana, in in many in many respects, is a gateway drug. There's others out there who are going to say it's not, but I believe research pretty much supports the fact that it is someone who, who, a young person who's likely to experiment with marijuana probably has the same character trait that is going to cause them to want to go from marijuana to something else with a bigger kick to it. Can, can, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but can you, people never ask this question, but can you define what you mean by gateway? Because I think different people have different definitions of that term. Well, gateway means, you know, if, if you've tried it, and, and you're not, it doesn't give you the same kick it does anymore. You're going to look for something else. That is the gateway into the use of harder drugs, in, in my view. And again, I think the research pretty much backs me up on that. Does everyone move on? No. And that's what I mean. I think it's, it's inherent in some people who have a character trait, a risk-taking character trait, who want to go bigger and better and more. You, using that rationale, though, I mean, you can go back to prohibition of alcohol in the 20s and say that because it was illegal, that titillated an element of the public, and, and that in itself is the gateway device that you're just talking about. Well, I think the, the, the people with the problem character flaw in that group end up as alcoholics. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't necessarily move on to, um, to drugs from alcohol. I think there's a distinction between the two. That's my opinion. Yeah. Now, we'll, we'll move on to the other subject, which is nowadays police forces across Canada and, and the United States are facing new challenges. And that like, we saw in the Sammy Atim case in Toronto, where because of the video, 
it exposed uh, a situation that looked horrific on video. We recently had one in, in Ottawa in the Byward Market where a police officer, you know, was very uh, active in, uh, in hauling someone down and repeatedly punching him in the head. With the access to the internet and access to smartphones nowadays, does it change how police have to police? Well, it, it should. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that there's there's thousands of recording devices out there on the streets in the hands of people who just happen to be bystanders, who uh, are likely to catch catch an image or two or run a video of, of police officers, as you said, being active, uh, and looking to uh, to put it on the internet, look at looking to put it on YouTube to show the world what they've captured. I, th I think technology is going to cause police to fully understand that they're being observed. And not that that should amend behavior, because bad behavior is never defensible, I don't think. Whether there's cameras out there or not, uh, there are incidents that are captured that, again, I, I see them the same as the general public do. You know, I watch them and I, and I draw my own conclusions to um, to what to, what led up to, to tragic circumstances or um, officers being overactive or overzealous in making arrests. Um, again, you know, there's a push for, for us to wear cameras so we can justify what we do all the time without fear of someone making a, a false allegation. So cameras are here. Ca cameras are handheld devices. They're either going to be on police officers' uniform facing outwards or there's going to be people out there with devices um, looking at us. Have you seen the Sammy Utim video? I have. Do you, wh wh when you, when you was not just a police officer, but as a chief of police, if that had happened to someone on your staff, if that had happened here in Cornwall, what, what was going through your mind when you watched something like that? Uh, you know, no, I prefer not to comment okay. on, on something like that, Jamie. And, uh, you know, my position ha has never been no comment. But in that situation, we have an active investigation both by the SIU, uh, the Ombudsman mm -hmm. weighed in on this, the, uh, the Toronto Police have brought in a, a retired Supreme Court judge to help them out with their own internal review of training. So again, I don't think it's proper for me to comment on what I saw mm -hmm. uh, and, and transferring that same set of circumstances here to my community because uh, every incident, uh, and, and particularly tragic incidents, need to be assessed and weighed on their own merit. The facts that, the, that were attached to that particular event will come out in, in due course and um, the fact that there's a criminal charge been laid would indicate that uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna hear exactly what was either in the officer's mind or what transpired that evening. Now the province reacted to that case or, or it was sheer coincidence by announcing that they now are more supportive of, of officers Getting have, being issued tasers. What's what's your position on the taser situation? Sure, we, sure. we know that there was uh, a move uh, a few weeks ahead of, of that fatal incident in Toronto to allow for a loosening up of the the deployment regulations with tasers or conducted energy weapons. Um, you know, I think I think the proof is in mm -hmm. that tasers or conducted energy weapons save lives if they're in the hands of people who are properly trained. The, the, the number of times that citizens aren't hurt, the number of times that police officers aren't hurt, uh, are huge. They, you know, they they far away the um, the low number of tragic events that that occur from their usage. And I suppose you know when you're looking at uh, can we trust police officers with tasers? Mm -hmm. We've trusted them with pistols. Yeah, there's a little they, more they damage have, with a pistol and a taser. Yeah, and, and you know, resorting to that level of violence or, or use of force is going to result in death more often than not. So this is all going to boil down to training. This mm -hmm. is all going to boil down to officers having the training, having the equipment, uh, using them when it's appropriate, uh, not using them when it's inappropriate. And uh, that's always been the case even with pistols. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, uh, we were trusted to be trained and to know when to use lethal force, and that's not going to change with conducted energy weapons. Now, you, you mentioned the word training three times in the last few minutes. With all of the video clips that are showing up on YouTube and other places, and, and, and how social media is, is bringing to light more incidences, do police need a different type of training or additional training in how to deal with certain situations, especially in light of the fact that everybody has a camera nowadays? 
well, again, police officers um, in Ontario all graduate from the Ontario Police College. Uh, they're subject to their own internal um, use of force training every year. Uh, In-service training is a big part of, uh, of what we do, ensuring our officers are current with, uh, not just with respect to legislation, but, um, you know, when is appropriate to use force and when it's not. These are individual cases again. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm not going to suggest for one minute that the police in this province are out of control and they're exacting violence on everyone they run into. These are isolated incidents. Again, they have to be weighed on their own merit. The, f the fact that we now see them, though, mm -hmm. makes it sound like, through again, through media, that these are happening every day all over the place. And uh, I think that's f the furthest thing from the truth. You, we can go back again and we'll, we're almost wrapped up. But the, you mentioned the 18 to 20,000 calls last year here in Cornwall with your police service. Approximately, because I'm, I'm sure you don't have the numbers you know, at hand, how many incidences resulted in an officer having to draw a weapon? Oh, we have those. I don't have those numbers in front of me, mm -hmm. but we, we certainly have those numbers. We report to the board on use of force mm -hmm. annually. And the, the number of times we've had to use force, whether it be um, what we call open hand uh, or empty hand techniques, baton, pepper spray, taser, firearm are, are well documented. And the number would, for most people, would be surprisingly low. They, they would look at those numbers and say, well, that's remarkably low. Mm -hmm. Are we looking at 1% to 3%? I'm going to say you're close to uh, to one percent. Mm -hmm. you're, you're probably right. One to two percent uh, is is the, the, the range. With the number of arrests that we make, mm -hmm. and the number of times that use the force has to be used, it's it's remarkably low. People are generally compliant. Uh, the the odd occasion, people are going to resist being arrested, or we're going to have to intervene in a very violent situation to uh, to affect an arrest. Again, the number is very low. Uh, we uh, we have to by by law submit use of force reports anytime force is used, anytime a gun is even just unholstered, let alone fired. Same thing applies with, uh, with conducted energy weapons. When, they're, when it says they're deployed, that means they're, they're shown, mm -hmm. uh, they're outside their, their holster, and the person is aware that there's an additional level of, of weaponry being displayed by the officer. So we, we can go back through um, the, the past number of years and have a, have a look at our use of force options, how often they're used, and it doesn't fluctuate much. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't. And, and I wouldn't expect that to, to change with the deployment of, of, of uh, conducted energy weapons to all of our frontline people. The circumstances dictate the use, not the availability. So is that going to be a political decision or a budget decision you have to work out internally? Well, both. We're, we are working on a, on a report for our board to consider at the next board meeting with respect to, you know, if they consider this as something that they want to do in this, this community, here are the options. And cost mm -hmm. is going to be one of those. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a variety of options, whether every officer gets one, every frontline officer gets one, whether there's just a sufficient supply so when officers start their shift they can take one with them, drop it off at the end of their shift, whether they're assigned to a vehicle. But right now there's equipment obviously issued at the beginning of an officer's shift, like a radio, mm -hmm. and it's turned back in at the end. So a, a conducted energy weapon may in fact be like that but again there's all sorts of other things that have to be considered the training the cost the, the you know the approval the, the the wise counsel of our board in deciding whether that's what they want to do in our community or not all right thank you very much chief parkinson okay.